All right, so welcome, welcome back to our surgical demonstration. I hope you enjoyed the Socratic debate. Uh, I think that was quite an event. It was uh, uh, fascinating to listen to those uh, experienced surgeons go against each other. Uh, it was very enlightening, uh, but now we're back for the surgical demonstration. Uh, we have Dan Rue here, who is uh, one of the uh, surgeons uh, on the surgical team here at Oxpine. A cervical surgeon, as you know, with a lot of experience in minimal invasive open deformity surgery, but everything in the cervical spine. So we're very excited to have you here, Dan. And uh, as part of our set of surgical demonstrations, you know, yesterday we did a bunch of lumbar cases. Earlier this morning, we did an endoscopic lumbar laminectomy. But we also want to do some cervical surgery, of course. So we have today a cervical laminoplasty, and that's something I know that you do obviously a lot amongst other things. Uh, and it's an operation I think that is, uh, is kind of experiencing a little bit of a renaissance, right? Uh, because of the recent data showing that it's associated with uh, really superior outcomes, less pain patients. For the right patient at the right time, uh, it's, it's a great operation. So, so maybe tell us a little bit about cervical laminoplasty in general, and then we'll, we'll see you perform one on this real spine model. Sure. Uh, the paper that uh, Zoe Gogawala published in uh, the Journal of American Medical Association recently showed that he uh, did a study with multi-center, and I was a part of that uh, study. Uh, and um, we randomized patients to an anterior versus a posterior operation. So they had to have equipoise. And then uh, the surgeons could do anything they wanted anteriorly or posteriorly. And uh, so uh, the patients were randomized to either a posterior cervical decompression and fusion versus laminoplasty or anteriorly ACDF versus uh, corpectomies. And what he found was that the best results with the lowest complications were uh, in patients who had the laminoplasty. Now, uh, laminoplasty is a great operation. It was invented in uh, Japan and it was initially used uh, for patients who had OPLL, but then expanded to include all myelopathies, all patients, even patients who had radiculopathy and multi-level disc herniations uh, have been uh, reported to get good results in Japan. So the indications for laminoplasty are patients who don't have a lot of axial neck pain, who have a normal alignment. You can have up to about a 13 to 15 degrees of focal kyphosis. Uh, they can't have a C2 to C7 sagittal vertical axis that's more than about 35 millimeters. That means that you drop a plumb line from C2 and then a line from the posterior superior corner of C7 across, and that has to be less than 35 millimeters. What that says is if you've got a leaning tower of Pisa-like neck and you do a posterior cervical, it's gonna fall down and they're gonna have a lot more neck pain. It's been shown that they do much better if you don't do a laminoplasty of C2 and C7, because C2, because that's where all the extensor muscles attach, C7, because it's got a tall spinous process. And the neck extensor muscles, the major one being the semispinalis cervices, are brought together and tethered in the midline and they go over C7 and they pull on C2 and that's a suspender that holds it up. So the reason that C7 is so tall, the vertebra prominence, is that you need to get the biomechanical advantage of having this off of uh, the spine. If it were just right on the spine, you pulled on it, you just scrunch the spine together, but you wouldn't extend the spine. So if you remove C7, then you end up with a, a, an elongated extensor mechanism and the neck tends to sag. So your muscles have to work overtime to extend, that causes increased neck pain. So if you have neck pain that's ridiculous, you can do foraminotomies with it and, uh, and still get reasonably decent results. But if your patient tells you, you know, my neck pain is really bad and if you don't fix that, I'm not gonna be happy with you, you shouldn't do a laminoplasty. And, um, the other thing, a, a guy named Taguchi uh, reported that it's better to do a C3 laminectomy as opposed to a laminoplasty. And the reason is that if you do a laminoplasty of C3, it butts up against the big spinous process of C2. So by doing a laminectomy of C3, you don't have, and then laminoplasty of say four, five, six, uh, you don't have the laminoplasty where you've hinged it up, hitting the spinous process of C2. Also, when you have to do a laminoplasty of C3, you got to dissect a lot of the muscles off of the C2 spinous process and lamina. And you don't want to dissect those muscles off if you can avoid it, because once again, the major extensor muscles attach primarily on C2. 
they have attached to C2, 3, 4, and 5, but C2 is the, the, the most important uh, attachment. So you want to try to leave that alone and not disturb the extensor mechanism's attachment to C2. So it's important to um, leave that C2 alone, do a laminectomy of C3. And then if you have to um, decompress that C6, 7, because you need something behind C7, I have done C7 laminoplasties and I have gotten away with it, but I'm always scared if I have to do that. And if you can just undercut it and do like a dome laminoplasty of C7, undercutting it, you're better off. If you take too much of C7 and go up into the spinous process, you can actually cause a stress riser where the patient goes like this and they fracture that spinous process off. That's happened to me a couple of times. So you want to stay, if you're doing a dome laminoplasty, stay kind of low. And um, uh, post-operatively, uh, you can, uh, I don't immobilize my patients. I give them Toradol if they don't have renal insufficiency or cardiac problems. I give them a soft collar for comfort, but I tell them to exercise right away, start moving their neck, and they can do anything that they want. I put a little bit of epidural depomedrol uh, right underneath the caudal lamina. I put about uh, 40 milligrams of depomedrol there, and I put 40 milligrams to the subcutaneous tissues, and I sprinkle vancomycin and ANSEP powder into the wound. That way, number one, you won't get an infection, and number two, uh, the depomedrol will give a lot of pain relief so that I would say at least 25% of the patients will say, I have no pain after the surgery and they can resume normal activities uh, almost immediately. 25% of the people still have a lot of pain. So I always tell everybody, this is gonna be an incredibly painful operation. You're gonna say, you're gonna hate me for about a month and then you're gonna like me. And, uh, and about 75% of the people say, you know, it wasn't as bad as you made it sound uh, you know, that it was gonna be. And so I was pleasantly surprised. You always wanna, undersell and overdeliver rather than oversell and underdeliver because then patients aren't happy. Uh, I always tell them it's going to be much worse than, uh, than uh, they think, uh, than I think it's going to be for them. So Dan, I think your patients always love you regardless. And, you know, so, <laughs> I wish that were true. But but what, 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 they love Roger. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Let's maybe let's yeah. go ahead. We've got a model here okay. and uh, we've got uh, about, you know, 35, 40 minutes. So yeah, that should be plenty but if of time. you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll keep on asking questions or, or you comment obviously on what you, what you do and why you do it and how you do it. Definitely. So this is uh, uh, C2, three, four, five, six. I'm going to just do a laminectomy of C3 and then do a four or five laminoplasty. We're going to leave C2 alone. Now this model has interspinous, um, or, I'm sorry, supraspinous uh, uh, ligament and basically the nuchal ligament complex. In the cervical spine, there is no interspinous ligament and there is no supraspinous ligament. It's all nuchal ligament complex that uh, comes off of the uh, C7 and comes all the way up into the base of the skull. And uh, so you wouldn't have any of these uh, uh, ligamentous structures that are uh, represented in, in, in the spine. So the first thing I do is uh, do a laminectomy of C3 and uh, that's pretty quick. You just, uh, uh, you can either piecemeal it or you can just, uh, uh, take the burr and, uh, and burr it down. And I usually do something like that. And then I go right to the burr and, uh, and basically you find the ligament and flavum and you stay on the ligament and flavum and you just keep burring until now, if you don't have compression at C23, you don't have to go all the way up to the C23. Here's the ligament and flavum. So I just take the burr and use that as my protector and just grind away. And the ligament and flavum goes up about two thirds of the distance behind the C3 or any of the uh, laminae in the uh, cervical spine. So I'll take some of that away. And same thing on the other side. Now you would usually use about a 2.5 millimeter carbide tip uh, matchstick burr. Um, so this is a little bit bigger than what I would use and a little bit rougher, but uh, but it works. We have uh, we have Ibrahim Hussein who's uh, assisting today. Yeah. So so Dan, let me ask you a question. Uh, yeah. So if you do laminectomy versus laminoplasty, what mechanically? I mean, why why do you think those patients have less pain? Well, what's the no? I what's, think they have the advantage of, yeah. of keeping the bone there. I think they have the same amount of pain, but the difference is when you do a laminoplasty. If you ever have to come back, the advantage is this: if you ever have to come back 
Yeah, if you, Ibrahim, if you wouldn't mind squirting a little bit there. Thank you. Oh, oh this suction doesn't work. All right, we'll try that. So number one, um, you know what? This suction, I don't think, doesn't work either. So now we got the uh, cord. So number one is that if you ever have to go in, you have a covering over the spine so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, injuring the cord. So there I've done a uh, about a 75-80% laminectomy of C3. Now the ligament of flavum attachment is right there. There's a spinal cord there. So we're done with that part. So, so uh, sorry, Lance. So what's the advantage of laminectomy ver other uh, than the prophylactic? Yeah, you know, and then the other thing is that when you do a laminoplasty, you're taking the lamina here and you're lifting it up like that. And so the lamina that you lift it up is as tall as the spinous process used to be. And so once again, the extensor mechanisms can attach to that and help pull the spine back. Whereas if you do a laminectomy, all you got is the muscles attaching to themselves. They get nothing to pull on. So, it's, so the only place that they can pull on is C2. Whereas naturally the semispinal services starts at T uh, two, three, four, and five, and it attaches to C two, three, four, five. So it gives you a nice lordosis by pulling on two, three, four, and five. If you do a laminoplasty, it can reattach to the lamina and pull on each individual. But if you have a laminectomy, it, the only There's attachment is a C two, sure. so it has to work a little bit harder. So I think that, but does it make that much of a difference? No, I think that uh, laminectomies work well in terms of uh, neck pain, and you can do you know, like a one level laminectomy two level laminectomy and I will do one or two level laminectomies without um, uh, doing a, a laminoplasty. But when I go beyond that, I think a, uh, a laminoplasty does have the advantages. Now I'm gonna do a laminoplasty of, uh, let's say this is four and this is five. So uh, I'm gonna pretend that that's seven. And uh, for the sake of time, I'll just do two instead of uh, a typical three. So uh, we'll just create some space right here. There we go. And usually I, I use the burr for just about everything. Um, so I'll uh, go through the ligament and flavum with a burr. I'll go through anteriorly, the anterior longitudinal ligament with a burr. I'll go through everything because it's just a, a little bit faster. So the first thing I do is I cut completely on one side. We're gonna go cut partially on the other side. Completely, I go, the first cut is the deepest, like the song goes, zip, 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 And how do you decide the side? Which, which, where do you do the full cut and the partial? Yeah, so the full cut side opens a little bit more than the partial cut. So whichever side is more symptomatic in terms of myelopathy and which is whichever side is more compressed, that's the side I will. If it's equal, then I'll typically stand on the patient's left and and do it that way. but. Today, I decided to stand on the patient's right because the model was facing this way. It doesn't really matter. I mean, it's, it's uh, I think as a surgeon, you got to get used to standing and doing this on either side. So that's the second cut. And then the third cut is uh, now the gingerly cut. And in order to avoid epidural uh, veins, uh, what you want to do is make it thin, but not go all the way through. And then what you want to do is if it's, if it's a good amount, it'll crack with the last one. I think that's almost ready. So uh, that looks like uh, I'll just uh, leave that and then go on to the next one. So again, first cut is safe. You can go pretty deep because. And then there are, there are different systems then for instrumentation, right? Yeah, yeah. How, how, do, you, how do you pick uh, which one do you use? I think uh, uh, most uh, spine companies have a, a, a system you can use and so, whichever system you like better. Uh, I'm using um, uh, Nuvasives today, but I don't have any conflicts with Nuvasive for the laminoplasty, although I did uh, recently help them develop a posterior cervical fusion stuff, but uh, not, not this. So that one's loose, that one's loose. And, uh, but I used to use Medtronic. Um, I think other companies uh, have uh, uh, stuff. So whatever you like is, uh, and feel most comfortable with, I think is a, a reasonable thing. Uh, I'm gonna demonstrate with a Nuvasive today. So I'm done on this side and you wanna make sure that the cuts are straight. And uh, then, oh, by the way, if you if you have somebody with foraminal stenosis, you wanna do a foraminotomy and um, uh, you, you wanna leave enough of the facet joint to prevent it from, um, uh, uh, so that you can put the plate on. So let's say that you need to do a foraminotomy here. 
So you take about 50% of the facet joint, expose the underlying facet joint here. You would, um, oh, one other thing is I use what's called bivector traction, where I have one traction rope on a Jackson frame that uh, would pull the neck into flexion, and another one that would uh, pull it into um, uh, extension. So I start with the patient in flexion. So here's the, you can see the leading edge of uh, the superior articular facet there, right, right down there. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, so first thing you do when you're doing a foraminotomy like that is just, I like to notch the superior lateral corner. And uh, once that's done, then all you have to do is cut from there up to the pedicle and from there medial laterally. And when that piece falls off, you're done with the foraminotomy, you feel for the pedicle. So we just very now slowly go back and forth until you, there you go. So the nerve is usually uh, yeah, trapped under the SAP, right? Right, it's, it's a superior articular facet. So once you thin it down like this and it's thin enough, then I take a little curette. We don't have a little curette, so I'm just gonna pretend this is a curette and then just, there we go. And then when you break off that facet, uh, you're done with the foraminotomy and there's a root underneath. You feel for the pedicle. Here's the pedicle. And uh, so your cut needs to be right around the pedicle so that it gives you the maximum amount of room. So that would be a foraminotomy. There's still enough room there to put a plate here. Then you go to the opposite side and the opposite side is actually harder to do because on this side, you just have to go until you cut the lamina. But on the opposite side, if you do too much, then you're in trouble because it'll break. Dan, Dan uh, just a question here. Yeah. Uh, from the audience, uh, Dr. Uh, Kulakowski, uh, where do you put the, at the end, the vancomycin, you put it on the fascia or you put it just- uh, No, I just, just sprinkle it in the wound. I, I sprinkle it. I use vancomycin and ANSEP powder on every case I do, anteriorly, posteriorly, whatnot. Yeah. So the last posterior infection I had was about, maybe 1800 cases ago and it was in 2005. And uh, so I don't worry about, I don't worry about infections uh, um, because if you put, it's not just the vancomycin and ANSEP, it's that when I was doing my own closures, I would put 150 sutures and it would take me 45 minutes to close this wound. And uh, now I have the plastic surgeons do it and they do a similar thing where they spend a lot of time and use a lot of sutures. So there's no dead space. And then yeah. they leave a drain in for a week. I used to leave it in until it was less than 30 cc's in an eight hour shift. But if you drain it so that there's no, and there's no dead space and you drain the deep and you drain the superficial, you put vancomycin and ANSEP in there. Vancomycin alone, I would still get occasional infections. But throwing an ANSEP and vancomycin powder in there, I use a gram of each. It sterilizes the wound. Yeah. And uh, even when I see that, uh, you know, like the, somebody's contaminated a little something, you know, and, uh, and it's just a split second, you know, like they're walking across and their little tail from their gown touches something. I mean, it probably didn't get anything. Yeah. Normally I would have said, take that gown off or put yeah, a yeah. something yeah. steri strip on it or something like that. Now I don't even yeah, worry yeah. about it. And, uh, and uh, of course you irrigate constantly. And during this entire procedure, you're irrigating, you irrigate at the end and I'll, I'll point that out again. But so now I've cut it completely on this side. We're going to cut on the other side. Now, and, what's uh, your what's your, just another question? Yeah. What's your concern with the CSF leak drilling, you know, drilling uh, drilling the trough? Yeah. Uh, so mean, and how do you prevent a leak? So what you want to do is you want to make the you want to leave the last thin layer of bone so that it's translucent. That's yeah. why I do it under the microscope, and then you just kind of push the spine; it'll crack, and that way it. Um, I have had a dural leak doing this. Um, I think twice out of hundreds of cases. Uh, one time it was that um, uh, the fellow was using the bobie to dissect and the patient jumped and the, and the bobie yeah. went in and cut the dura. Another time I <clears> cut <throat> it, uh, I didn't realize I cut it, but I, I guess I was doing with the burr like that when I was going all the way through and that happened. Some people like to use uh, the ultrasonic uh, uh, to cut that. Uh, and I think that works. The only concern I have with that is that uh, it burns the bone and you may not heal it on the hinge side, yeah. but 
I know guys who uh, uh, use it and think that it's it's really wonderful and that can help prevent yeah, it. Yeah. But using a tiny uh, matchstick, I think, is the best, and just keeping an eye on it yeah. and not going too deep is is the way to well, do I, that. I think I had my only leak actually with the ultrasonic. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it I doesn't prevent it, it then. Yeah. All right. So on the hinge side, we go. It's slightly different on this one. I just started here and 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 brought it this way. The other thing is you want to pull on the bar. You don't want to push. When you push, you can all of a sudden snag and then go. Whereas when you pull, it's like the difference between a front wheel drive and a rear wheel drive car. It's better to pull the car than push the car. On the other side, what I do is I notch the top and I, I'm sorry, the bottom and the top because it's like an airplane wing. This is all cortical bone. This is all cortical bone. So you got to get through that cortical part. And then I've done this part, so I know how, how thick that lamina is. So I'm going to go for about 50% of that. And so I'm going to go zip, 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 zip. And go a little bit more because I don't know the characteristic of how brittle this, uh, this model. Uh, model is. Yeah. And if you have a, an elderly patient with a very thin, brittle uh, lamina, you're much more likely to fracture it and get a uh, broken uh, hinge. So you can always take more, so take a little bit and do that. Now, I've released it up at the top, I've released it here. Uh, the one place I haven't released is the bottom. So first I'm gonna create some space for myself and get rid of some of this so I can see between this and this. Let's get rid of some of this uh, ligament and flavor here. Yeah, let me ask you a question now. I, I found that uh, if I if I do all this work and I leave the ligament intact, yeah, and let's say I take the ligament at the very end after I crack after I lift up the bone, then during that process, the the, the amount of manipulation that you have to use is, is much greater, and then sometimes I break the other side. Yeah, then, yeah. Therefore, I I take the ligament before I lift up the bone. Right, exactly. You have to because. This ligament will prevent you from lifting it up. That's yeah. why you got to cut it at the top. You got to cut it across here and then you got to cut it across there. And then we can do kind of a dome over here. You don't want to head into the spinous process too, too, yeah. too far because you'll break it. But you can go into the lamina and do like a hemilaminectomy. I think the window is a little bit off here with the microscope. Oh, is it? Okay. I think if you just move it a little bit towards sure. you. Yeah. Is that better? That is better. Yeah. All right. It's for your side. It's better. Yeah. It's, it's not. You look at the contralateral side. Like oh, okay. Yeah. Here, let me zoom out. Is that better? Yeah, that, that should be better. Yeah, okay. that, that's good. And uh, let me. So, a so over a, there's a, a question like from the from the audience. Uh, what was the second drug? Uh, so it's Vanco and Ansef. Yeah, it's Vancomycin and Ansef yeah. powder. So Ansef is a cephalo. What is it? Cephalo. Yeah. Cephalos, it's a cephalosporin. Yeah, it's it's uh, cephal. Is uh, let's say cephalexin. I can't remember now. Yeah. <clears throat> the first generation cephalosporin. Yeah, what do you do to prevent sinking? Uh, sometimes it can, but that's why you want to make sure that you get all the levels that need to be done. Because sometimes what you see, you see, you see this ballooning out like this and you go, you know, I'm not sure that's going to be enough. And then you got to sort of look at your MRI and decide, is it worth it? The other thing you can do sometimes is if you're really afraid of the kyphosis, you can flip the patient over either at that time or later and just do an ACDF at the C67 level. Now, especially if they're already a little bit kyphotic. And, um, and then, as I said, I don't want to go up into the spinous process. So I'm just kind of undercutting and doing a dome laminoplasty over here and uh, coming across like that. And then. Yeah, I had a, case, a patient recently where we did a combination of ACDFs and the yeah. laminoplasty in the back. Right. Uh, I think that was a patient who needed a uh, lower level ACDF and then higher up, I did laminoplasties. And that was a really nice, it was kind of nice to see that you can combine those procedures. You know, yeah. it's, it's like all, it's not all or nothing. You can really, 
you know, if you if you if you look at the the symptoms and the imaging findings, you, you can kind of creatively combine some of those procedures. Yeah, definitely by uh, doing like a one level ACDF. Let's say you have like focal kyphosis at one level. You just do the ACDF at that one level, and do a laminoplasty at the rest of it, and and uh, that way you don't have to fuse everything. You could just do a combination of an ACDF and a laminoplasty. So. All right, so I've kind of undercut uh, over here without really, uh, and, and leaving the dorsal aspect intact. Uh, so your nuchal ligament would start, let's say this is C7 starting here and go up. It's the continuation of the supraspinous ligament. There is no such thing as an intraspinous ligament. It's only the interspinalis muscle. And uh, so, and we've uh, cut the opposite side. So now we have to lift up. And uh, then what I do is uh, I take a uh, curette and uh, let me zoom back so you can see. So I just put my finger on the spinous process and put a curette under it. That way, if my finger slips and it snaps shut, my curette catches it. And if the curette snaps, then my finger catches it. It's a belt and suspenders. So I lift it up. Whoop. I guess it is a little brittle. So I do one, and then I would go and do the other. And then I would go back and do one. I would do the other. This one, the ligament and flavum is uh, very stiff. It just kind of sticks together. So it's uh, in, in real life, you would separate as you would just lift one and then you would lift the other. You, now, take, the, you take the ligament in the trough where you made the full trough. You take that ligament out? Uh, on this side, basically what you can do is just, it, it's a longitudinal ligament. So you could just, just kind of do that with a curetinal cut. Yeah. Now, if it starts to bleed, which it often does with epidural bleeder, what I do is I just squirt some... Uh, hemostatic, you know, the like surgery flow or flow seal, whatever one you use. I just squirt some there and I just gently let it tamponade. And then I put a patty on top of it and, and I wait for about uh, 10 seconds. And then that usually uh, seals it. And then you can lift it up. If it bleeds again, I do that same thing again. I put some uh, surgery cell on top of it, a little patty, and I just kind of hold it there. I think Ibrahim can dial up the bleeding a little bit. So Get yeah, so like far, a, this is uh, this is bleeding about as much as all my cases bleed. Like, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah like uh, we don't believe in bleeding. <laughs> right. Uh, if you believe that, uh, I got some uh, land in uh, Florida to sell you. And then <laughs> after that, we put in a, um, a, a plate. Now, now, this is the Nuvesa plate, uh, but, the, you know, other plates are very similar. You have two options on these plates. You have a plate that... Um, has, yeah, this, this is a different plate from last time. Yeah. So the last time I think I used a Medtronic. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and it looks very similar, but uh, you either have the plating options that are medial lateral or cranial caudal. I prefer this. Why? Because the most common complication is putting the screw into the next joint. And it's easier to do that if you have it cranial caudal like that. Um, and sometimes after you've done a foraminotomy, there just isn't enough room to put that there not have it interfere with the next facet and not violate the next joint. So that's why I, uh, I usually prefer uh, the, oops, sorry about that, cranial caudal, uh, I mean, medial lateral uh, kind of a, a, a screw arrangement. So then you just slide that under and uh, they have two different throat sizes, one that is uh, small and one that is large so that if the lamina is thick, you use the larger one. And if it's thin, you use the smaller one. So then I do that and then what uh, I do is I hold that in place, uh, typically with my thumb and uh, maybe a little curette like that. And then I have the fellow come in with a little burr um, and, uh, and they notch that little thing. Now we don't have a small burr, but we do have a little uh, drill that uh, is a manual drill. And uh, now I, the only time I ever had a patient that had uh, a, uh, a quadriplegia or uh, quadriparesis or uh, was a woman I was doing a laminoplasty on by myself. Um, the fellow had moved on to the next room and uh, I was uh, putting in a screw single-handed and uh, the screwdriver slipped off. It went across and grazed the cord on the other side. And she woke up uh, hemiparetic and I told her exactly what happened. I documented it in the chart and thank God for her and for me, she recovers everything within a week. 
that's as close as I've ever come to a uh, quadriplegic event in uh, something like yeah. 6,000 cervical cases. But uh, so I recommend never using a single hand with any tool that you're pushing into the spine. And, uh, and I'm about to violate that because uh, uh, I have to do it in this case. But fortunately, this patient has given me permission to render him a quadriplegic because he already is. He's already, <laughs> he's already lost his head. But so. this, uh, All see, right, this, so. is a, this is a tricky part. I have the fellow hold like a Penfield one. Yeah. And try, but it, it is, it is, it is tricky to, uh, to really do this. And, yeah. Cause uh, it starts to rotate. So yeah. what you can do is just put one in and then you stop. And then put the other one in because that one prevents the rotation. So yeah. you don't have to finish uh, one completely. It's also with this system, you can put in that, that laminar screw before you do any of the uh, yeah, yeah. trough work. That's so true. I yeah, you would, can uh, <clears throat> drill and uh, put the, the uh, screw there before you even do the uh, um, yeah. uh, foraminotomy and laminectomy. And, uh, and that way it's, it's uh, very easy. I just use a burr. Yeah. And, uh, and I typically just, this is way too big for that screw, but I would just, you know, put a little notch there with the, whoop, I guess uh, that yeah, thing the, was the hitting. Com the company, they have a, they have a, a drill, a battery drill. Yeah. He's just trying to challenge us today. Yeah. By not bringing all the appropriate instrumentation. Thank <laughs> you so much. But, but yeah. I, I mean, I think that, that uh, if, if, uh, if you don't have a little uh, a drill that you use, because I use a 2.5 and a 1.5 drill, you can just do this before you do the trough and yeah. uh, before you do everything. That way, it's, uh, it's a, a pretty easy way of doing it. Um, I typically don't uh, uh, do that, but, uh, but I would say that's probably the safer and the better way to uh, handle it. And uh, so let me just uh, finish uh, putting the screw in. And as I said, it's, it's uh, one of the things about uh, these screws is it, it, it's, the screwdriver has a really good bite, so it doesn't tend to fall off. Do you use monitoring for these cases? Oh yeah, yeah. I use uh, monitoring for all um, patients uh, that uh, uh, need a uh, yeah. Ibrahim, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, kind of holding that like that. You use monitoring for cervical foraminotomy? Uh, I have, but if I'm just doing that, I probably wouldn't. I so if I'm running two rooms and I'm in a hurry uh, and there's no indication, I won't use monitoring. Uh, but, um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind just kind of stabilizing that. <laughs> yeah. So Ibrahim is doing this without looking at the, uh, microscope. He's doing it by looking at the screen, which is pretty difficult. It's like doing an exo, uh, what is that called? Exo video that, uh, you guys were showing yesterday. Ex exoscope. Exoscope. Yeah. Exoscope. So you would have made a great orthopod because you can do that, uh, like, a a, uh, you could do it like uh, it was a, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, arthroscopy. So you put the second uh, screw in here, and then you put a screw in here. And uh, I wouldn't recommend using this if you've already done the laminectomy, because it would be very difficult. Uh, it would just use a burr or just put the screw in before you do it. And basically, you get the idea. Now, the final thing you got to do, though, what is the most common complication of a laminoplasty? And everybody gets that wrong. Everybody thinks, oh, it's a C5 palsy. Wrong. The number one complication of laminoplasty is loss of extension motion. Why? Because people don't sew the extensor muscles carefully enough and the muscles dehisce to the side and you have an ugly looking incision. That's why you got to put in like 150 sutures to bring the muscles together. Number two is that they don't irrigate all that bone dust out. That bone dust sitting there acts as a, a perfect fusion material and uh, so it fuses. So I, under the microscope, I irrigate until I don't see any more bone dust. So I use a bulb irrigation and I use a, uh, a little syringe irrigation. So I flush it out of all the little nooks and crannies and make sure that there is no bone left whatsoever. So you gotta make sure that it's all gone. So we answered Harry Gephardt's question. He's asking what's the most common complication. So make sure that all the bone dust is gone. And then, then that's when I put the epidural depomedrol in there also. 
one last thing that uh, you got to make sure that to do <clears throat> is another reason that you get um, loss of motion is that you hinge one lamina up and you hinge another one. And if you didn't do it right, they don't shingle. You got it and they end up hitting each other. So what I do then is I take a burr and remove all of the bones. So then, and then I extend the neck to see that there is no bony block to full extension. So in a case like this, after I've stabilized it, I would, uh, this is gonna be kind of uh, brittle, but I would remove enough of the lamina here so that it doesn't hit this one. And then the final thing is I remove the spinous process here. I'm gonna remove it on this one since I have the plate. Otherwise that spinous process will impinge on the muscle and will rub back and forth. So by removing it, it presents a nice smooth trapezoidal surface to the dorsal uh, muscle and it'll be much, much better. Woo. We and, got, um, we're smoking here. Woo. So by removing that spinous process like that, we got a nice trapezoidal shaped uh, dorsal spine and that's a much better uh, presentation to uh, uh, the muscles here. It's much more even, it's flat here, it's coming down this way and coming down that way. The muscles will then sit on top uh, and, uh, and, and sit on top of this. And so it'll be lifted off and it'll be able to grab this and do an extension. And then I want to make sure that it can still shingle, uh, and, uh, and that this isn't going to hit that. I would put a plate there and then put some, um, Depomedrol underneath the, I use a little angiocath, a one CC syringe, use 80 milligram per CC Depomedrol and use, uh, about, uh, four tenths of, uh, I mean, about half of it and put it underneath, a lamina here and squirt distally. And then I put some into the subcutaneous tissue there. And then the final thing to get hemostasis, I put some surge of flow or flow seal on the sides. I put some surge of cell on the sides and I take a surge of cell snow and put it over. And I could just kind of tamponade, throw the antibiotic thing and then ask the plastic surgeons to close. That way it bleeds very, very, very little post-operatively. And, um, and all that hemostatic agent, if you ever go back in on a patient like that, within about 24 hours, 48 hours, it's all gone. The body just absorbs all that cellulose and everything else. But in the meantime, now you don't want to put it on somebody you've done a laminectomy on because it'll swell and cause core compression. But with laminoplasty, you can put it on top of all of that and it stops the bleeding. So you have very little bleeding intra-op and you have very little bleeding post-operatively. And um, so that's how you, you want to do it. Minimize the bleeding minimize muscle trauma, come right down the middle in the avascular, amuscular plane. Be very gentle with the retractors. I don't use retractors with teeth like that. I use McCullough retractors, uh, which were invented by John McCullough, and they're flat. And with a little thing at the bottom, I put a, a two by six um, patty, those, I call them mongo patties, as in humongous patties. I put that in, and then I put the blade on top of it. By doing that, uh, the soft tissues don't dry out. And by irrigating frequently, the soft tissues don't dry out. Anytime I use retractors, I put that patty first and then, and then I put the retractors on. That keeps the, uh, and especially when you're doing an anterior, you don't want the esophagus and everything else to dry out. You wanna keep it nice and moist. That's why you wanna irrigate frequently and you wanna cover all of the muscle area. I, I tell uh, uh, the fellows, treat that muscle like it was, a muscle in a part of your body that you would really care about and then you wouldn't want to dry out. And every fellow chooses a different muscle in the body, uh, but, uh, but whatever muscle you care the most about, make sure that you would want to take care of it. You wouldn't want to cut through it. You wouldn't want to macerate it. You'd want to keep it nice and moist so that it maintains its, uh, uh, its integrity. If you do that, then patients will not have that much pain. They will heal faster and they will be able to extend their neck. That's all. Or treat it like a Porsche. Yeah, you treat it yeah. like a Porsche. I don't have a Porsche, but uh, if I had one, I would treat it like that. What about um, at the end when you when you do the closure? Uh, do you, you said the muscle is going to attach to that uh, elevated bone. Yeah. Is there anything that you do to uh, facilitate that? Do you you know do you attach the muscle specifically to the bone? Or no, I don't. I mean, just... when when you go back on these patients, you see that it's all scarred down there. Yeah. And uh, and that if you've done a good job of dissecting the muscles, then uh, the muscles look really good. I mean, I learned that technique from um, 
uh, Teteru, uh, I'm sorry, uh, from, uh, uh, um, oh, I'm blocking on his name right now, um, uh, is a Japanese uh, surgeon, and, uh, and he described these beautiful, meticulous ways of uh, uh, getting down there and, uh, and dissecting it and preserving the muscles. And he shows very nice uh, uh, post-operative MRIs and compared to pre-operative MRIs and shows that most of his muscles, uh, when you do a dissection like that, uh, uh, they don't end up uh, with, um, um, uh, oh, Tetero Shiraishi is his name. Yeah. Uh, so Shiraishi, uh, he uh, um, was the first one that I know of to describe the technique of uh, uh, preserving the muscle uh, as much as possible. And that really minimizes the bleeding, minimizes the pain, and uh, maximizes the ability to extend the neck postoperatively. So when you do the closure, yeah. uh, you said you use 150 stitches. So yeah. I, I assume you uh, you isolate like layers of muscle and you individually. No, close when I that's or... what the plastic surgeons do. I don't. I I didn't. I I I don't do that. What I do is I just take very tiny little bites. Yeah. You don't want to grab a lot of the muscle because you necrose everything that's in yeah. your bite. So by coming down in the avascular muscular layer, you leave the fascia intact. So the first layer of closure is the interspinalis muscle, and then the other thing that uh, uh, that you can do is that uh, another thing that uh, is you just leave the muscles attached to the bifid spine and you do an osteotomy where the bone is at left attached to the muscle and you just cut it and let it fly and then you tag it with a suture and that way you're closing bone to bone as your first layer right then you you take the little fascia and if you've done a very meticulous dissection the muscles are still enveloped in fascia you take the fascia and you take tiny little bites that's why you take so many sutures yeah and then you distribute the force across and you close one layer, then the next layer, then the next layer, then the next layer, then the next layer. And, uh, and if you do that, it, uh, it, it really does uh, uh, make a difference in, um, uh, in post-operative pain yeah, yeah. And, and also cosmesis. Yeah. It looks a lot better because you see patients who have a really, you know, like completely depressed back of the neck uh, where, uh, I mean, when I first started out, I used to do that. Um, and uh, I used to close in like three or four layers. It would take me, you know, like yeah. 15 minutes to close yeah. a posterior wound. And, uh, and they would all look terrible. And, uh, uh, but that's how everybody closed it back then. And that's uh, what I thought was the right thing to do. Uh, but um, uh, then uh, I found out that it's, it's much better. And the more la layers you do, the better it is. And so over the years, I went from like using like 30 sutures to 50 to 70 to 90 to 120 to 150. And, and, and by, by the end of, uh, you know, the last couple of years, it was taking me 45 minutes to an hour with a fellow closing a wound yeah. that's only this long. Yeah. And I would hate doing posterior cervicals. The nice thing about New York is that we have plastic surgeons who close the wounds for us. And, uh, and, and that means I get done with the case much faster. And um, uh, what about the, uh, sometimes you see patients post up, they come back and they have like this muscle that's, that's almost like a wet neck. Right? Yeah. What, 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 do you, what, what do you think that's coming from? How do you so there are that? a couple of things. Number one is the most common thing is that I think that if you don't close that, they dehiss and the extensor muscles come to the side and they become almost flexor muscles. Yeah. Then the neck starts going forward like this and they have an increased C2 to C7 sagittal vertical axis. The muscles are over on the side. So they're now being, they're pulling like crazy. So they're over on the side rather than in the back where they're supposed to be. So the muscle groups have to be aligned in the middle and instead they're splayed yeah, out on the, the side. side. That's why yeah. they're so, so yeah. I think what those people need is some kind of a muscle, like uh, um, uh, a, a redo muscle closure by plastics to bring it all together. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the plastic surgeons here do a yeah. great job yeah. of making sure it doesn't happen because the wounds always look good. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I think uh, that, that that's a very important part of it because uh, it's not just the fact that the plastic surgeons close the wound for us. It's that they do a very good job of bringing it together and preventing yeah. that complication. Because, you know, you can fix a bony problem. You really can't fix a soft tissue problem. Yeah. And uh, the soft tissue problems are what really plague the posterior cervical uh, operations, I think. Because the surgeons are reasonably good at taking care of the spine aspect. They're just not as good about the, the soft tissue aspect. So it's, it, I think it is worthwhile yeah. having... Uh, somebody who, you know, is uh, trained in uh, being able to bring that muscle envelope back together to get a good yeah. result. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, I agree. We've got great plastic surgeons. 
uh, two more, two last questions, and then we'll finish up. Stratifix, do you do you, do you use that? Yeah, so I did use uh, Stratifix. Uh, Maybe what 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 Stratifix? And, Stratifix yeah. is uh, a uh, a suture. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, it's an absorbable uh, suture, and um, and it has barbs on it, so you don't have to tie it. So basically. Because it's a barbed suture, you put it in and you wrap it back, and then it's got a little tab at the end. When you pull on it, it it snags it, snugs it up so that you don't have to uh, tie the suture. And then it's a running um, uh, suture, and it just locks in place. And at the end, you just uh, lock it in on itself and yank up. And because it has these barbs, it can't go backwards, and so it saves a little bit of time. Yeah. I know the plastic surgeons use it a they lot. It yeah. I yeah. was using it. They are pretty expensive, and even when I was closing the wound, I would use it occasionally, but I found that it was so expensive yeah. and it wouldn't save a whole lot of time yeah. for me. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so I didn't use it a lot, but, uh, yeah. but so I think it's, it's, yeah. it's something that plastic surgeons like. Yeah. And then and the seroma from vancomycin. I know people talk about that. I've, I've never seen it. I haven't seen it either. The seromas uh, are deep and that's because there's a, a dead space. I've not seen a seroma in the subcutaneous because we obliterate any space between yeah. the lamina and up yeah. by putting so many sutures in. You don't want any space. Oh, and the other thing is that when you close the wound, you don't want to just uh, uh, close each layer because then you have a layer here and you have a layer and you have a, an empty space. What I uh, do is when I do that, I bite on this side, I go and bite the bottom. And then when I bring it up and close it, there's, it's tacked to the layer yeah. below. And by doing that, there's no dead space. If okay. there's no dead space, yeah. the body will be able to fight off an infection. It's only the dead space is like a walled off abscess where the where there's no um, vascularity. That's where the bacteria will harbor itself and hide and, uh, yeah. and multiply. Yeah. So by eliminating all that dead space, and that's what plastic surgeons do so well, they eliminate the dead space. Yeah. That's why they don't get infections. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and if you do it that way and you throw in, and I sprinkle in vancomycin, and then I close, and I can and and sprinkle a little bit more. Yeah. But uh, but uh, by doing that, it uh, and if they're allergic to ANSEP or penicillin, you can use some tobramycin. They come in uh, thirty gram vials, and, and I use uh, you know a tiny um, uh, percentage of that. I use maybe a, about a quarter of that, along with the vancomycin, uh, and uh, and just sprinkle it in the wound. And again, that covers gram positives, gram negatives. And we have not seen super infections. Yeah. And uh, and uh, now that's been shown to be of uh, good benefit uh, um, and virtually eliminates infections. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. So uh, I think that brings us to to the end. Pretty much, we've got a few more minutes. Uh, are there any more questions here? Anybody here? Any questions, comments? Ibrahim, thanks for helping. Yeah. Thanks and, so much. Uh, uh, Dan, of course, thanks for your time and thanks for doing this. This was great.